Welcome to the No BS Spiritual Book Club's live streaming interview series, where leading new thought teachers, speakers, and authors share the intimate stories behind the 10 best spiritual books that inspired them the most on their spiritual journey. From well-known classics to hidden gems you might never have heard of, the No BS Spiritual Book Club saves you time and money by sharing reliable recommendations from those who've walked the path before you. The No BS Spiritual Book Club, the only No BS guide to the best spiritual books to inspire your own journey of self-discovery. Here's your host, founder of the No BS Spiritual Book Club, Sandy Sedgebeer. Hello and welcome. Before I introduce this week's guest, I just want to share that if you're struggling with making important decisions, there's a book I highly recommend called The Necktie and the Jaguar by retired clinical psychologist, Jungian analyst and shamanic practitioner Carl Greer, in which he shares how he tapped into the wisdom and power of unseen worlds for guidance and inspiration. It's a truly fascinating memoir that offers some valuable keys and questions that inspire the kind of thinking that guides you effortlessly on your own path to transformation. And you can check it out for yourself at carlgreer.com. And now, joining me today to share the stories behind the 10 books that influenced him the most on his life journey is Maverick Deep Ecologist, spiritual coach, shamanic guide, and the founder of Sacred Earth Network, Bill Pfeiffer also known, preferably known, as Sky Otter. Um, and Sky Otter has dedicated his life to building an earth-honoring culture. He has 25 years of experience in re-evaluation counselling and vipassana meditation. He's undergone extensive training with Siberian shamans, and he's partnered with and designed experiential workshops with people such as Joanna Macy, John Perkins, Lynn Roberts, Kathy Pedilano and John Seed. And he's also the author of a highly claimed book called Wild Earth, Wild Soul, a Manual for an Ecstatic Culture. Bill Sky Otter, welcome. Pleasure to be here as always. Not this particular show, but it's great to be speaking with you again. You too. It's hard to not call you Bill. Um, hard to remember to call you Sky, so I might switch back and forth. Hope you don't mind. I don't mind at all. Good. So tell us why you say books are a mind meld. Um, that's a great question. Uh, to me, whenever I read a book and I'm I'm liking that book, the the author's mind is melding with mine, and it's a it's not only intellectual per se or the symbols it's an energetic transmission and we know what that means you just this person's if especially if they spent if they've spent years on a on a book uh their heart and soul comes through and uh you're you know you're touched if they're sincere and authentic authors and all these 10 books are you know top shelf uh that's going to come through isn't it interesting how we know authenticity when we see it? And we don't know why we know or how we know, but we do know it. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a it it's been a kind of a a behind the scenes uh central discussion in my entire adult life and really it it's been kind of coming up more and more and when I was 21 you know, somebody, some sweet person who was kind of a, a mentor and a friend said, you're real, Bill, you're real. And it was like, that felt really good. And and uh, I've wanted to be real ever since, you know. Mm, yeah, yeah. And life does its best not to make us real. It wants to mold us, shape us and, you know, help us conform to other other ways of being than ourselves. So yeah, it's it's really nice to meet real deal people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Here we are. So, here we are. So tell me, what was it like for you to have to go back all those years over your life and pick just 10 books that you thought really guided you along the way? 
Well, I, I think I said so, said in the written, uh, kind of the, the written version or the, the summary of this, uh, of this interview is simply that those 10 books just, they just jumped off the shelves. I didn't really think about it. I didn't spend a lot of time. It wasn't a logical process. I have a, a bookcase right here and, 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 and in the other room. And I just started looking and then there were a couple that I went almost and then I, then I, then they just chose themselves. And, you know, I think that the other thing is that the reason that, that they were easier to choose is that I have a, a thesis that we'll probably get into later on in the discussion, which is there's a there's a lot of spiritual language out there and it's all good and it's beautiful and it's like different paths up the mountain but my thing is earth honoring culture i want to i want us to honor honor nature really honor it not pay lip service to her and so i'd say six of the of the 10 that was the that that's what that that's the central theme. Mm. Okay, well, let's start with your books. And later on, you can start telling us how you became interested in honouring nature. So book number one, um, unsurprisingly, Touching the Jaguar, Transforming Fear into Action to Change Your Life and the World by former economist and advisor to the World Bank and governments turned activist, John Perkins. Yeah, well, I'm 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 real glad to start with that one because John is a mentor and a friend, and um, you know he's yeah. It's funny in you in the in the very opening, you mentioned the, who I don't know a guy named Carl Greer and the Jaguar popped up, and two of the books on my list have Jaguar in them. I didn't think I did not think that through, and. When I when I I did a series of shamanic trainings with different people in in um, North America in Siberia and with John who is who is bringing back the Amazonian and Andean tradition with him, and he did a brilliant job of of that energy transmission. But this time it was in person, and in the book he. Um, the jaguar courage and spirit and you know the main theme throughout the book is um we need to move through our fears for a for a better world for our, for our children and i think one of the things that i admire about john and that comes through loud and clear in the book which was quite unusual is uh he's not afraid to get into the political sphere and that's you know that's a rough game a really rough game and he's he's been in there for a long time and i don't know if i said it in my little short review but he felt in in that book he felt like he did in in confessions of an economic hitman that he had some amends to make some big amends that he felt like he really was on the wrong side of history and then he did this truthfully quite revolutionary switch with his life and um yeah i'll i'll always be grateful grateful for him because he's he's a man of courage truly and he, to this day he doesn't let up he's like 75 or something and he's just it takes a lot of courage doesn't it i mean you know he was working at the highest level uh, you know, World Bank's, um, you know, Fortune 500 companies. And I think I read a description that, um, you know, he was, when he was an economic hitman, he was convincing developing countries to build huge infrastructure projects that put them perpetually in debt to the World Bank and other US controlled institutions. And at first, he sincerely believed he was, you know, this was the best model for economic development. But then he, re he came to realize it was really a new form of colonialism. And I mean, to turn your back on all of that at that level, you know, and say, I I'm not doing this. Um, 
it takes a lot of balls. It really does. And with a daughter. Uh, and with a daughter. So, mm -hmm. and but the thing that he has told me personally, and I think it comes through once or twice in the book, is that he wanted his daughter to know that he was authentic and that he was committed to his principles above all. And so he had to make this switch. Now, you know, this revolutionary transition, transformation in his life, you know, or else he, you know, he has to live with himself ultimately. But I, I just think with the daughter aspect, the, it's tremendous, tremendous courage. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the great gifts of kids, isn't it, is that they keep us real. And we will do things for them that we wouldn't consider doing otherwise for anyone else. Yeah, yeah. Tell me, what does, I mean, you talk about the Jaguar. Um, what does touching the Jaguar mean? Well, I, I, moving through fear, having the courage to move through fear, but the way that I suspect Greer means it, the way that John means it, the way that I mean it, the way that I understand the Amazonian shamans mean it, is that there's a, a there's a there's a fierce um, uncompromising instinctual primal way of knowing reality that we all have inside of us and it's that primal knowing which as you were you were touching on before about how it's been it's been kind of drilled out of us or trained out of us we've been domesticated so coming back the jaguar is 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 beckoning us to come back into our, our into our wild nature and i mean i get the shivers just talking about a, the, what the jaguar spirit the animal and the spirit really means mm. yeah yeah you know i got chills when i read um one of uh, john perkins books and uh, i don't remember which one it may well have been the economic it's certainly he told his story and i was just blown away you know, at, um, at his courage uh, and thought, I want to meet that man. You know? yeah. Love those stories. Um, OK, so let's move on to number two, which is uh, a perennial classic. Um, Power of Now, a guide to spiritual enlightenment, Eckhart Tolle. Well, I didn't describe the book because I said it was probably the best book I ever read. And it wasn't a book for reading. <laughs> it was it was a book for experiencing. And it and you now Eckhart is consistently reminding us, and these are my words, is that source energy, infinite intelligence, he would say, you know, or not quite, but the ground of of being is right here and right now. And that um we're fooling ourselves to think otherwise. This is it. It's always now. <laughs> I just think that's hilarious because yeah. our, our minds are constantly future or past oriented. And then he just comes along and, and kind of like bops everybody on the head like a Zen master. Yeah, we're all trying to escape the now all the time, aren't we? Aren't we? Yeah. yeah. Um, number three, um, Black Elk speaks being the life story of a holy man of the Oglala Sioux by John Neil Hart. Um, tell me more about this one. Wow. Um, every time you mention a book, I get the I get a, a small version of that big energetic transmission. Uh, I think that there's so many ways to go about talking about that book. But I think the, the best way to start is simply that uh, it argue, it's arguable, but let's say along with the Apaches, the Lakota Sioux were the fiercest, fiercest, put up the fiercest resistance against the U.S. Army. And they were not going to, they, they were going to do everything to maintain their wildness and their way of life. Um, and and yet they were physically 
physically overpowered and starved and so uh and diseased and so forth and black elk comes along and he goes to the mountaintop and he has a vision not only of his people and if i break if i break down crying in this interview you'll understand why because i'm so moved i mean he's up he and his people are up against everything he goes up on the mountain he has a vision that is not only for his people but it's for humanity and it goes way into the future uh in terms of you could call it the reconciling force of 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 uh of the races coming together of people living in harmony again with the earth and <laughs> and also and this might be the important most important thing i say on this interview is actually understanding what the spirit world is the unseen world behind the the behind the scene world and so he does such a good job in that book of putting that front and center uh as a way that you know we're talking about spiritual books here as a way to move through humanity's imp impasse or 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 adolescent phase we could call it uh and uh just brilliant and it, you know we're, we i think one of the themes that we're you know we we're touching on is not just authenticity but courage and unbelievable courage unbelievable mm. Yeah, and this from a man who was probably perceived, um, you know, by the soldiers, the Western um, people, as somebody who was unintelligent and, um, you know, just so backward. Yeah, like a little, yeah, like backwards mm -hmm. and backwards and nuts. And that's the way we've been brought up is that everybody who doesn't subscribe to let's call it like the white colonial program is is we're you know <laughs> we're we're primitive and and uh yeah savage yeah yeah wow you know i mean there's been so much truth that's been shared over the years and then buried um i can see that this book is a very moving book and one that's very poignant for you do you remember when you read it, what you were doing, um, how it impacted you, the change that it shifted in you? After I, uh, after I had that mystical experience at 26 years old, which I think we touched on in our last conversation, but I'm not sure. It's on my bio. Uh, I do, you know, I, I do a write up on what happened to me at 26. I went through a period of what I would call kind of classic peace uh, and then environmentalism, uh, peace work, environmental, sort of a, I would call it kind of a, ma a mainstream approach. And I'm, I'm proud of it and uh, I'm really happy about it. And as soon as I got out to both the Southwest and Siberia, which was happening, I was kind of, for all sorts of reasons, going back and forth. Um, I just, <laughs> I felt firsthand, like never before that the, that indigenous wisdom and the indigenous worldview were paramount and central to, again, humanity's impasse or our evolutionary struggle, if you will. Actually, a good way to talk about it is the birth of humanity. Like I sense that we're giving we're giving birth to something greater. Uh, I really feel that. I don't feel like we're just going down the down the tube. But it's a painful, painful birth, and uh, and and so the indigenous worldview and prophecies take that take that very much into account. And so when I read his vision, it was it was an yeah a, a complete validation of all these kind of like mini peak earth earth <laughs> shamanic experience that's the best way to say it these these uh shamanic experiences of the natural world backed up
by the indigenous ancestors. So he was like confirming all of that. Did you, I mean, were you moving in this direction before then? Before this experience at 26? So my my mom and dad got divorced when I was five years old. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. My dad lived uh, 40 miles outside of the city, uh, which back then, 40 miles outside of the city was actually the country. And um, he, he we, we both, where he lived and within 50 miles of, of where he lived, there were arrowheads all over the place. And I would pick those up, Sandy, and I was like, whoa, there is... There was something really serious, seriously good, cool, different going on here besides what I've been taught. Like I felt their spirit at that at that time. But it was they were these were momentary childhood experiences that didn't have any bite, so to speak. Uh, And then it's all it's (laughs) it's completely built up steam more and more and more. In fact, last night we had a sweat lodge ceremony here, the first, the first one on this land, and uh, yeah, it's just for my money. This remembering our indigenous soul is uh, it's a ho- it's a beautiful homecoming, and you can be a Jew and a Catholic and a Buddhist, and uh, that doesn't that doesn't keep you from knowing your indigenous soul or an atheist. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Our next book, I'm going to move on, is Return to Love, Reflections on the Principles of A Course in Miracles by Marianne Williamson, which is a beautiful, beautiful book, published in 1992. It's funny, too. It's Mm. funny. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah. I love Marianne. I've met her once. I've, you know, I went to a lot of her talks. Uh, Speaking of authentic, she's the real deal, and uh, she's uh, she's in service to humanity. And she figured it out. You know, she got it. She was she was absolutely miserable, and uh, God is love, and love spoke with her very very clearly, and basically said, "Get off your self centered ass." <laughs> and she and she and she listened, and. Uh, yeah, I I just love her. Uh, in that book, I love the combination of uh, hu- like her own humanness and neuroses, along with these, uh, yeah, just tremendous spiritual insights into what it means just to to live and live in this crazy culture. Mm. Yeah, yeah. You said that the book helped me take the high road in the aftermath of a painful divorce. Yes, it did. Um, I think in life, we always have this choice. We get to, uh, when the pain is pain is uh, acute, when the pain is really acute, we can go into uh, deep fear and blame mode and hang on and wish it could be different and uh want to make in this case our partner all wrong and and uh, and there are other there are other parts of life besides dozens besides a divorce but i think <laughs> you know we're talking about the 10 best spiritual books here so spirituality is about choosing the high road it's choosing love. It's choosing decency, virtue, respect, and connection. Uh, and there's a little faith element there. There's this faith that somehow we're going to get through this. That little voice inside says, "This is not going to be the. <laughs> this is not going to be your last marriage." I'm laughing because I've had two. And uh, you know, this is not going to be your last marriage. It's not going to be your last relationship. So, um, you know, <laughs> get over yourself and, and get over yourself and, and yeah, move into, m- move into higher, higher ground. Hmm. And that's, that's what, that's what happened to me. And it was not easy, Sandy. I was miserable and scared for about a year, but I, 
I definitely with in reading the book, I was I was guided to to move out of that of that misery. Yeah. Mm. One of the things that um, I remember from that book was when she said that relationships are where we meet ourselves. And that stopped me in my tracks. I really had to think about. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, 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 I think I, I, you know, I've said this to you before publicly and privately. I love your questions and what you bring out in your, uh, you know, in the, in your interviewee and that for my money, Sandy, like at 65 years old, I, you know, I told you in the last show, I do, you know, I do mushroom ceremonies and I do all this crazy stuff, you know, sweat lodge ceremonies, vision quests, taking people to Siberia, but the best medicine is an intimate relationship with one other person that you, that you love. It's the best and it can be the bitterest medicine, but boy, do we ever grow. And I think everybody who's listening to this knows that it's true. Like we just, we don't know why, but they are our mirrors and they show us all of our little weak spots. And they also conversely bring out our greatest love and passion if we're willing to put that on the table. Yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Talking of mushrooms, book number five, <laughs> Plants of the Gods, Their Sacred Healing and Hallucinogenic Powers by Richard Evans. Richard Evans? Schultes. Schultes. Yeah. Albert Hoffman and Christian Ratch. Ratch. I, I, I don't know him. Yeah, you don't I, know, know him. I know the first two. Yeah, well, he was the one that wrote the original of, you know, this book that you'd listed was published in 2001, but he had written a book in 1979, and he joined forces with these two gigantic, eminent researchers because to publish it again, because now they had a lot of the research. Um, one of them was a, a, an anthropologist and Actually, he was the anthropologist and ethnopharmacologist. Um, and the others were able to help with all of the um, latest research on uh, psychoactive glory. So you're talking about Ratch here? I'm talking about, um, no, I'm talking, yes, I am talking about Ratch. Yeah. Okay. He, was the because, one, he was the one that wrote the original. Because you just taught me something. I didn't know the first thing about him whatsoever. Uh, I've been, I just uh, learned about and focused on those two luminaries, Hoffman and Schultes. And so thank you for that. Mm. So tell us about the book. Tell us about the mushrooms. <laughs> um, I, I, I said to you earlier in written form, where would we be without the plants and where would we be without the psychoactive plants? So another theme of this conversation is humanity's impasse, uh, our um, tremendous need for, for collective transformation. Uh, and the, the plants, particularly the psychoactive plants are uh, elder elder teachers, and if we have the courage, uh, and we're willing to um, do so responsibly, with the proper set and setting, with people of integrity, we can. Uh, <laughs> going back to our previous conversation, we can, we can do ten years of personal growth in a few hours. Um, and um, uh, I, I, after my experiences with them recreationally in my late teens and early 20s, I was frankly just scared of them. Like I didn't want to, they just were too intense for me. And then about 10, 12 years ago, they came back in my experience as in, in a responsible way. And it's been this very gradual uh, process of 
thanking Mother Earth and the Great Spirit like never before. Like they're constantly giving us these gifts if we're just willing to receive them. And that book is the most, uh, I mean, I guess you could call it the, the most comprehensive or exhaustive in terms of lining it all up, explaining what they are, peyote, San Pedro, the big ones, ayahuasca, psilocybin, and so forth, and saying what they are, you know, and also, and I think this is for any for for anybody and everybody to know where the where the 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 safe limits are. Like just like for some people, a boga in from Africa, they can handle that. I'm not touching it. Uh, and uh, datura, forget it. It can kill you. So I think that 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 book makes these makes it it condenses all this information so we can say okay I'm willing to go there but not there. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and you know we know there's so much research be being done right now with psychoactives and depression, anxiety, um, you know, all kinds of things, and and it's astonishing, you know, some of the results of it, but uh, at the same time lots and lots of people are doing ayahuasca ceremonies um, because it seems to be quite fashionable. And um, in some cases, I think, well, who can say? I don't know, you know, so I can't judge. But uh, it does help to have a book that tells you what is safe, what isn't safe, and uh, everything you need to know about them. Yeah, I mean, safe is a relative term. I mean, life is a risk. Everything we do is a risk, especially getting in our automobiles. Um, and it's and so we're we've been taking calculated risks. That's one of the reasons why we're alive and happy. And uh, I'm talking about you and me. And 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 so I had I've had very powerful experiences with ayahuasca, but I would approach with extreme caution and feel and feel safe about the set set and setting and do do your research really do your research mm -hmm. i because sandy more and more people are are doing it and south that's become sort of one of south america's uh the amazon's uh you know money makers so if it's gonna be and we're not gonna stop it uh if it's gonna be then we hope that it's done in again with the most integrity and that people who research it uh do so well do it do do a good job of researching who and where etc mm. you did say in your write-up that this book is where ethnobotany meets magic it's your bible um for this partnership dance not use dance mm. with rather than use of these soul development accelerators. Great description. Tell me what you mean by dance with. You see this as a co-creative yes, process? Very, 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 yes, exactly. That um, life, life wants to create more life. Life wants create, creativity. So creativity and life are kind of two parts of the same momentum and spirit and so and it so it takes so that there's the flesh the human flesh and there's the the plants and the fungi which are an entirely different kingdom uh and um you know when you ask me about blackout speaks the central theme is all our relations and so there's all this elder wisdom all around us, and are, do we want to dance? You know, it's a it's a dance if we if we choose. It's a both a like a circle dance with a group of people, and it's also, you know, it's a one on one slow dance or a fast dance. Uh, yeah, I think it's I think it's a very good metaphor. It also takes a little bit of fear out of the exploration process. Mm -hmm. if we, approach it a little bit more playfully and not like ah they're gonna they're gonna destroy my ego and i'm gonna end up in a mental hospital you know mm. yeah 
So book number six is Seeking the Heart of Wisdom, The Path of Insight Meditation by Joseph Goldstein and Jack Kornfeld, with a foreword by the Dalai Lama. You asked me about the power of now before we talked about it briefly. So Vipassana is the practice of the power of now. And the Buddha is the most famous practitioner of the power of now. And so it's a, it's a training. It's a training in presence. And uh, it's, I once t- told a Dharma teacher, I said, you guys have this down to a science, don't you? And so that book is just like, boom, 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 boom. And, you know, for a lot of people, and it was certainly a very, very much a part of my formal path, uh, Vipassana is super, super strong medicine. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful, a beautiful way to go. Um, And those two guys are, are, they don't have the name recognition that Eckhart Tolle does. I mean, very few people do. Uh, but they have the, yeah, I, 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 you know, this it's sort of silly to compare these things, but they have the higher conscious, they share the higher consciousness that he does. Hmm. Hmm. So now with book number seven, we go back to the Jaguar, a talking Jaguar this time, Secrets of the Talking Jaguar by Martin Prechtel, 1998. And you said it was difficult to choose one of Prechtel's books because they're all exceptional. So tell us more. Um, Why this one? Well, I also said that it's, yeah, I, I, I consider it the, the best written book in the, in the 10. And, and so it, what I mean by that is it's not that the others weren't great wordsmiths and it wasn't that they couldn't convey beautiful spiritual information. It's that this guy is a magician poet. I mean, this guy has a ability with language that I don't, I don't know if anybody else on the planet quite has it. I mean, there are, there are others. They're just not quite as well known as he is, Mm. but every sentence just jumps out at you and brings you into, and here we go again, into um remembering our indigenous soul and our embeddedness in the natural world and in this and and in the shamanic dimension behind that natural world so i said that just now in a very very kind of western almost academic way he says that through poetry i mean it's not poetry classic poetry but it's poetry and that book is his his uh, his initiation as a as a, a as a medicine man, a shaman. And there's a special word in Mayan that I can't remember. Uh, but he, I said to a friend last night when we talked about him after the sweat lodge, I just said he's the real deal. And my friend said he can't get over. Uh, he, he he said I I couldn't get over the f- f- like a paragraph without bursting into tears. Mm. Well, you said it's the best because it reads like a combination of wine and chocolate on a torrid summer afternoon. Who could resist? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, number eight, a book that's close to my heart. Um, our dear recently departed friend, Hank Wesselman, Spirit Walker, Messages from the Future. And uh, yeah, it was through Hank that I met you. You bet. God bless Hank. I, uh, I, I, I feel like I checked in a little bit before with Hank before, to, you know, before this, this conversation. And um, yeah, so Spirit Walker is the is the most fun dystopian uh work of of art you 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 know you 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 ever want to read and it makes you it, it makes me feel okay about uh you know it, what he lays out in spirit walker is essentially the 
inevitable. I think you could say that. I mean, inevitable, unless there's some drastic transformation, inevitable collapse of technological civilization going back to the Paleolithic period over the next 5,000 years. I mean, talk about a vision. And he says that that was not anything that he concocted other than the fact that he had all this paleontology paleontological uh you know background that what a what an amazing paleontologist he was um but that it was the the spirit of nanoa and the hawaiian islands and and uh california that just came through him and literally talked this vision through and um and so anyway, just to connect it to the beginning of your question, he, um, he, 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 the book also um, conveys his vulnerability, his humanity, his beauty, and his passion. And that's what I saw in your interview with him. And I, it took my breath away. And I, you know, I don't do this every time I see a good podcast. I wrote to you within f- five minutes of it, of it being over. Yeah, because I, and I didn't know that Hank had passed. Right. He passed soon after that interview, um, right. and that was such a shock to me when you told me about that. Yeah. Um, you know, how can you not? be intrigued and drawn to a book, you know, that has a description like 5,000 years into the future, Nanoa had been sent by his chief on a journey in what used to be, into what used to be America. Um, You know, there's a guy from the future coming back to our time um, wanting answers and information. (laughs) I mean, you know, there, right there, that, that hooked me when I read that description. I had to read the book. Yeah, it it is stunning, and at a min at a minimum, it's a monster wake up call. Yeah, 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 yeah. God bless Hank Wesselman. God bless Hank. So, book number nine: slight change here, slight change of energy, sexual energy ecstasy, a mm. practical guide to lovemaking secrets of the East and West, by David and Ellen Ramsdale, published in nineteen ninety three. Mm. So this one jumped off the shelf and onto your list. Yeah, it sure did. Um, And I'm so glad it did uh, because, you know, that life wanting life, like life wants life, create the creative, the creative force, the sexual force. It's all the same force. I mean, it takes different vibratory aspects you know it was laid out by the greeks with with philos agape and eros but what we're talking about here is is really embracing eros but the beautiful thing about this book is that you know they're taking sex out of the second chakra and moving it into the heart and the and the, and into the higher 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 dimensions and so along with you know, psychedelics and meditation, all the things that we've, these, these um, ways, if you will, or methods, uh, sexuality is, is, you know, it's kind of right there and right there in, fr- in front of our face. And, and, you know, one other thing that I thought about you getting to this question is that <laughs> there's a way in which spirituality is above the waist. I mean, if we think back at, 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 zillions of conversations you've had and i've had it's about from the heart up but it's like sorry that isn't the complete picture and uh so we're busting out of the victorian age we're busting out of you know kind of catholic uh orientation to sexuality uh so yeah wild earth wild soul means really embracing our erotic nature yeah yeah because it is natural natural completely natural completely Completely natural natural. yeah okay so the last book on your list one river by wade davis Mm -hmm. published in 1996 
books and you say that no other book has the sweep of one river when it comes to the plight of indigenous peoples, particularly those inhabiting South America. Yeah, Wade, Wade Davis is, I don't know, he's probably about 10 years older than me. And like Hank and like John Perkins, they were kind of my heroes. You know, they were they were 10 years ahead of me and I was really, really admiring their work and learning from them. And One River is both a sledgehammer in terms of understanding what's happened to South America over the last, last um, hundred years, but it's also, and this is what, if Wade watches this, you know, he would say, that our duty as the rest of the world, the non the non South Americans, because he also, you know, there's there's there there's the Andean and the the other non Amazonian tribes who have very very deep spirituality. He would be saying, well, we should do everything we possibly can to preserve their wisdom and their language and their land. But if we're going to lose it, we need to protect what protect what they have, however we can protect it. And in and in and I think in his case and my case and John's case, it's not just protecting it as a kind of an intellectual concept, but really embracing it and doing doing our very best uh, to make it a lifestyle that is authentic to us uh, to make an earth honoring shamanic lifestyle something that is really authentic and isn't out for the money or whatever or are glamorous but is is really um changing the dream as john says over and over again it's about so i think wade's wade's book it, get, it, it sort of supplies all the information of like, what is this worldview that is so essential to us, uh, to us pre preserving? What does it really, what does it feel like? And so he does it in a more uh, academic way than, than uh, Martine Prechtel, but the, both of them are giants in terms of this what you know the main my my main thing my main stick as we say in yiddish mm. are you aware of the connection between wade and uh one of the authors of your other book um richard shorties oh yeah he was a wade's a student of richard student. yeah yeah Absolutely. yeah yeah and, yeah. and shorties was wade's hero yes you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah interesting um yeah, I think Short is sent to um, prize students to follow in his footsteps and unveil the botanical secrets of coca, yeah. the notorious source of cocaine, a sacred plant known to the in Inca as the divine leaf of immortality. Mm. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, so many plants, so many, so, so many teachings. Uh, and I think, you know, one of one of the very um, how would you put it like um, kind of obvious like elephants in the room is how <laughs> like you, you know you were you were talking to about it before in terms of the plants being um, you mentioned coca and I think that the, the that what happened to me as it sort of snorted up my nose is that coca is is in its original form not cocaine you know it's similar to co coffee in that it's very uh stimulating but in a in a in a in, a, in, in kind of in a beautiful you can function just fine um what am i getting at here life is magic sandy this planet is magic. It's heaven on earth. We've been given paradise. And so why did I say that? Because what a guy like Wade Davis does or Schultes uh, is their bait. Oh, and God bless E.O. Wilson, who just passed into the spirit world. Um, they are, they're pointing to this 
bio and spiritual diversity that is is in the whole built into the universe for that matter and we're like you know playing with TikTok or facebook i mean i love facebook but that's not the point there's mu- yeah. there's a little more to life than facebook yeah 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 so that's your 10 books but there are three that you said um you assume our audience knows about them but you would like to mention them tell us what those three are and why you want to mention them uh, the Tao Te Ching, the Bhagavad Gita, and what was the third one? And anything by Alan Watts. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. You know, I said it before. God is love that our discussion is, is in many ways uh, about seeing the deeper reality uh that there's so much more going on and that we're 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 held in and we're held in the embrace of love if we're willing to go there and so they don't they're not as schmaltzy as i am uh and and the three of the the three of them i mean you know let's assume that the Bhagavad Gita was pro- probably written by a few people as the Tao Te Ching, but um, they're classics in pointing out the 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 um, the deeper, higher reality that we know what we're talking about. Uh, you know, as Eckhart would say, all these words are just sign signposts, and it's up to us to kind of feel what that that means but they're they're elo, elo, those are those three elo, super eloquent uh erudite and powerful and i assume that most people have that would be listening to you at least know about those books mm, yeah yeah yes and uh, and they've all turned up on people's lists Good. <laughs> more than once. More than once. So tell me, what are you reading now? I'm I'm rereading uh, uh, "Touch the What Is It?" The Talking Jaguar by Martine uh, Prechtel, because what happened was the book jumped back out, and I said, "I I I I, I, I this is the one I'm going to reread." Um, and as I was saying to that friend last night. He's in a league by himself in certain ways. And um, and so as I reread, I'm just I'm I'm lear- I'm learning again and uh, and and just loving his, loving his message and his this the storytelling is is just you just love it. You 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 just say, how could this be possible that this guy actually live through these crazy crazy experiences but you know they're somehow you know he's not it's not a castaneda thing he's not Mm. making this up yeah 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 now in your keywords uh, we always ask our guests to give us a few descriptors of themselves and you know using some keywords that really represent what the the people close to them see in Mm. you um there were a couple you talked about, magic mushroom lover, a mystic, a misfit. You love the M words, um, hopefully memorable. But you also said magmanimous, as in aspiring to be like magma. Mm. Tell me about that. Love the question. Can, can you feel that lava coming out? of the 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 from the earth through the volcanic mountain and then coming through the top and then just cresting over into that that fire earth so if we're at my my when i'm in my best moments i forgot we were talking about me in my best moments uh that's uh I, I love that. I love to be a voice for the earth in that way so that it's not just a, a mental game, but to uh, 
to help people feel like we're 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 made of that stuff. We are that stuff. And uh, sometimes we're pretty hot. Speaking of sexual energy, ecstasy, and a torrid summer afternoon, you know. Uh, so so yeah, like uh, that's what I mean. It's like magma. Mm, and it's very expensive. <laughs> oh, yeah. expensive. Expansive, yeah. not expensive. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I want to ask you about Russia because Russia has become like a second home to you. You've been there 44 times assisting the environmental and indigenous movements through Sen. What attracts you to Russia? Well, this is good for this audience. I mean, first of all, I, I love it. I love the people. I love the natural world. I love in it in the broadest sense. I love all of Russia and let's say the European Russians and the Siberian Russians. They're just like Native Americans for now. They're American, you know, they're U United Statesers. Uh, they they just show me something about life that I wouldn't otherwise know. And um, I, I, I feel very strongly that I had a, a past life in Leningrad. Um, I, this used to be something I was very private about, but it was so overwhelming, overwhelming when I arrived in Leningrad for the first time in either 85 or 86. I knew I was there. I knew what they had gone through in in the the siege of leningrad i i understood what what the terror of of stalin and 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 the uh, and that and then when i got over to siberia i felt the super super power of the that's where the word shaman comes from 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 uh central siberia and uh yeah the, it's it, it, in during this conversation, I didn't think of Russia once, and then you bring it up, and it's like, oh my God, this is a huge, like it's an avalanche of mystery and abundance that I have been incredibly fortunate to to uh, to receive. Yeah, I'm going back there with a group. Uh, the next summer 2022 and i can't wait you think i would like really a little kooky you know i get tired of it and say seen that done that but no i can't wait so you you said um that it opens your eyes to things that you would never never get to know about can you you know expand on that a little bit what kind of things well the first thing that comes to my mind without insulting anybody is that um you know the the first world european american whatever it's sort of spread to it's kind of spread all over the place now but um it's a it's a kind of i mean including russia but it's a i was i was gonna say briefly the Russians are tough uh, in a good way, and I was there's a lack of uh, there's a lack of self-absorption or self-centeredness. I mean, it's not that they don't suffer from neuroses too. Of course they do, and it's there's a. I, I'm going to speak for America. I think that um, we are so dumbed down in this country in so many ways, meaning that we're just going from Burger King to whatever, like the bar and, and to the Bible, you know, to the, to the evangelical Bible. And uh, it's like, come on, we got to go a little deeper and the Russians are deeper. And so I think that I, 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 yeah, it's a lack. There's a lack of superficiality, and from the from the very beginning, since whatever it was, I got to find out so I don't keep confusing 1985 and 1986.
but from the very beginning, incredible amounts of hospitality, but within 10, 15 minutes, they're talking about the deep stuff. They're talking about conversations like, we're, you know, the different versions about what is this thing life? What are, what's relationships? What's this nature thing? What about the poets, et cetera? And, it, you know, this comes out in all the great, all the great Russian literature. Uh, and so there's a depth there that, 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 that I have to find it in the United States, whereas to me, it's it's everywhere. There's it's it's mostly everywhere. I mean, it's not that that hasn't changed, Sandy, and I'm being extremely overly general. But as an yeah. arch, but as an archetype, there's there's a lot of depth there. Well, I understand what you're saying, and as a Brit um, who's lived in America. Yeah. you know, for many years and uh, obviously experienced a lot of America and Americans. Um, I can see what you're saying. And I have wondered, is is that because it's more or less a young country? I mean, you know, it's not, but it is because once, you know, the West took over and, um, you know, the native, the native peoples were pretty much wiped out. It's... It, you know, it's only what three, four hundred years uh, history in a sense there, and I wonder whether that has something to do with this depth that you're that you're looking for and that you see in other countries that are much older. Well, you know, I, I'm listening. I, I, I heard you, and I was saying uh, to myself, I'm really tough on my fellow Americans, and and we get to be that way of the of our own, you know, of our own of our own people and <laughs> I love us very much and we are, you're absolutely right we are such a young country we are so young and I think what we're talking about is immaturity but god forbid we have to go through another civil war or something catastrophic in order for us to get a deeper sense of history the way most Europeans and most um, uh, certainly the Russians have. And I think you, you know, you've, you've, you've touched on the thing that I, I, uh, I didn't say, which is that, that the sense of history, where is our country in relationship to the rest of the world? And America is not number one, sorry. Well, here's the thing. We talked about history earlier. We talked about the power of now and the present and not being caught in the past or the future. So does it really matter? You know, are we putting too much on this? Does the past really matter? Does it matter that, you know, England has a longer history, recorded history than America? No, I don't think so. Yeah, but we're, it's not like... <laughs> Yes, each moment is fresh, but it's also born from all the the now moments that come before it. So I think it would be how would I say it? Like I I get what you're saying, and there's a purity of the enlightened state. Um, but I think there's like Eckhart Tolle is a brilliant historian, and and uh, is also very, very astute in terms of current events. So I don't think they're exclu I don't think they're no, exclusive no. whatsoever. And I think no. it actually adds to adds to someone's enlightenment for them to have a historical perspective. Well, and we mustn't forget that each now moment we're making history. You yeah. bet, right here yeah. and right now. Yeah. So and um, Let's make one that we want, you know, Let's to look back one. on. <laughs> um, it has been a delight to speak with you, Sky Otter. <laughs> and um, I really want to thank you for um, sharing your 10 best spiritual books mm -hmm. with the No BS Spiritual Book Club archive. Um, you know, they're great additions to our archive. And um, I love that so many of your books are about nature and about plants and about you know, some of the real natural things that really do matter that we mustn't forget about. Um, is there anything that you would like to say to our audience in closing? 
Hmm. Well, it, I guess in a spiritual audience, it can be a little bit cliche, but Terrence McKenna, uh, we met in the bathroom after one of his, his speeches uh, on the way out of the bathroom. Uh, I said to him, Terrence, you are, you know, you're just brilliant and I love what you're having, love what you say. And, you know, I was kind of, I was appreciating his uh, intellectual, um, yeah, I was appreciating his, his, his ability to be an intellectual giant. And he looked at me square in the face, like I'm looking at you right now. And he said, Bill, this is, it's all about love. It's all about love. And, um, and I think that all those, you know, we we're talking about relationships before and the natural world, it's all like, kind of like here we are in earth school. Can we, le can we learn? Like, that's what it's all about. And, uh, and it's a beautiful thing to discover in one's life and it makes things a hell of a lot easier. It does indeed. What a lovely word to close on, love. world needs a lot more of it. Bill Pfeiffer, Sky Otter, thank you for joining us today. And um, before we close, you can find everything that you need to know about Bill Pfeiffer, Sky Otter's book, Wild Earth, Wild Soul, a manual for an ecstatic culture, and his core program, Sacred Journeys and Medicine Sessions, at his website, Bill Pfeiffer. Org. And if you don't want to miss any live streaming episodes in this weekly series of 10 Best Spiritual Books interviews, you can sign up to save your space and be the first to know who's coming up next and receive last minute reminders on the video page at the no BS Spiritual Book Club .com. And there may even be a link below this video. Um, and while you're on the website, if you know you have a book of you but don't know where to start, click on the Work With Me tab and find out how my experience helping others tell their stories might be the catalyst that you've been longing for. So that brings us to the end of this week's show, which will also be available on all the major podcast platforms within a week. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and I'll be back with another episode of the No BS Spiritual Book Club's 10 Best Spiritual Books interview series at the same time next week. Till then, it's goodbye from me. <laughs>